This is a very interesting topic. Uh, it also happens to be one of my interests in research and is one of the least understood problems as far as movement disorders are concerned is dystonia. Uh, so I wanted to give, uh, I have no relevant disclosures uh, for this talk uh, and I have no conflict of interest to dis disclose. Uh, the objectives which I thought we could, we could review in this short time we have today is, is to give you a general overview of dystonia. I wanted to discuss what the different types of dystonias are, and then we will segue on to dystonia in Parkinson's disease, which is which is which is a topic of most interest. I am, I understand to most uh, of you in the audience today, and we will give a brief overview of the current treatments uh, for treatment of dystonia in Parkinson's disease and other disorders. So. Speaking of dystonia, so dystonia term, the term dystonia was coined in 1911 by Oppenheim. Uh, he called this to be dystonia muscularum deformans. So he, he, he described as the definition was muscle tone was hypotonic at one occasion and in tonic muscle spasm at another, usually but not exclusively elicited upon voluntary movement. So this was, this was a very clinical observation. And this was, uh, was he was looking at uh, fairly young adults. Uh, these were kids sometimes in their teens or early adulthood. And he made a, 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 a very nice descriptive uh, uh, co compilation of these findings. And he used to see this kids who used to walk around just be fine when they are resting uh, or these adults who are resting, they are just fine. But when they try to make a muscle activity or they try to move, the muscle would go into a tight tonic clonic spasm at times. So that was the, that was what was the original description and, and that was what it was told about. Subsequently, I mean, of course, over the years, we have tried to learn more about this and try to come up with more formalized definitions. So in 1984, there was the first consensus definition made by the Dystonia Medical Research Foundation, which is one of the leading uh, organizations uh, uh, looking towards, towards studying dystonia and understanding the, the complexities of it. So it was described by this uh, committee at that point as a syndrome consisting of sustained muscle contractions, frequently causing twisting and repetitive movements or abnormal postures. So this was the consensus definition. Uh, there have been uh, a lot of different papers about this. We will review some of the features of dystonia, clinical features and, and things like that. But let's first talk about how big is this problem. So dystonias are the third most common movement disorders after essential tremor and Parkinson's disease with an estimated 500,000 people affected by this disorder in North America, which I would say America, um, USA, and Canada. Uh, I think, and I, those numbers are grossly underestimated, and I think uh, uh, their numbers are significantly higher than those which have been noted in most uh, studies. I, I would say that because these numbers are based on people who come to tertiary care centers, uh, the problem with dystonia is not just in terms of getting treatment or getting the right doctors, but also with diagnosis. And there have been several studies in the past which have shown that diagnosis of dystonia is, is wrong in about 50% of the people at the first encounter. And at times for certain types of dystonia, it has taken patients to up to 10 years to find the right doctor to make the diagnosis uh, of dystonia. So, so it is... A, a very under, you know, uh, under in terms of understanding, in terms of clinicians' education, as well as awareness about this disorder, needs a lot. Uh, it, it desires a lot at this point. Uh, in terms of the general schema of how we categorize dystonia, you can call them to be primary dystonias, where there is no evidence of cell death or a known cause, like a genetic disorder, which runs down in the families. So when you look at the brain scans, you don't find any abnormalities, any lesions in the brain. The brain looks healthy. Uh, and there are no genes, which are at least the commonly known genes, which are associated with dystonia, which are identified with these. So these are called primary dystonias. Secondary dystonias are dystonias which are present, or essentially that abnormal twisting, tightness, stiffness of muscle, which we talked about, present in other neurological disorders, like for instance, Parkinson's disease, 
uh, both atypical and typical Parkinson's disease. Atypical, more commonly we see dystonias and atypical forms of Parkinson's disease and typical Parkinson's disease. We will talk about the, the differences between those two. I think the audience here is very well educated about the nuances of it, but I will briefly uh, tell you about those things. The genetic disorders, which lead to secondary dystonia. There are certain genetic syndromes like myoclonus dystonia, which involves this gene called DYT11 gene. Then there is a, this specific kind of genetic dystonia called DOPA responsive dystonia, uh, or it's also, no, it was described in Japan and it was called Segawa's disease. So this is DYT5, number five dystonia. Uh, and it's uh, it, the, the, the cl classical feature of this is uh, it happens predominantly in the lower limbs and they are exquisitely responsive to dopamine. So even like low doses, which we sometimes use for Parkinson's disease, like, you know, one tablet three times a day, or even sometimes half a tablet three times a day, there is a dramatic improvement in the dystonia. So these are called dopa responsive dystonia. Uh, dystonia is unfortunately a big comorbidity in a large majority of patients who have Huntington's disease as they progress. Uh, a lot of ataxia disorders, uh, spinocerebellar ataxia, a lot of other ataxia syndromes have dystonia, which evolves as part of the disease. Sometimes it can be post-traumatic. People who suffer head injuries, uh, motor vehicle accidents, or any other causes can develop dystonia as, as a sequela of post-traumatic problems. There are certain drugs which can lead to dystonia. Specifically for this population, uh, I want you to be well aware of medications of the antipsychotic class. They are very notorious, especially in patients with Parkinson's disease. They are, can elicit what is called is a dystonic state uh, because of the fact that Parkinson's patients already have a deficiency of dopamine and they are exquisitely sensitive to, to exposure to these. Uh, uh, taxia is a problem of balance and coordination. So there are uh, people who walk with like a wobbly gait. They have trouble with coordination. Uh, so for instance, when you are doing fine activities, people with ataxia have a lot, a lot of problem with coordination. So that is a problem. So there are sometimes ataxias are a neurodegenerative problem, like certain atypical forms of uh, neurodegenerative disorders present with ataxia because of atrophy in the brain involving certain brain regions. And sometimes they are genetic. There are certain ataxia syndromes called spinocerebellar ataxias, where there is involvement of the brain regions, which are uh, involved in balance and coordination. And as a result of that, they have a lot of problems with balance. And a lot of these patients, over time, as the disease progresses, they develop dystonia. And one other thing, last thing, is exposure to toxins. A lot of heavy metals, a lot of uh, pesticides, manganese, a lot of medic, a lot of medic, those things have been associated with with uh, with uh, dystonia. Uh, one of the classic things which was which led to a lot of interesting discoveries for Parkinson's was this toxin called MPTP, uh, which is actually used to make animal models of Parkinson's disease because it specifically affects certain brain regions, which can cause symptoms which look like Parkinson's. Uh, and cause dystonia. So those are the lot of different causes of secondary dystonias. But let me put your attention to the fact that, you know, besides the almost half a million people affected by the primary dystonias, there are more than 30% of more than 30% of people living with Parkinson's disease may experience dystonia as a symptom of, of either have the disease itself or as a complication of treatments uh, of, 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 of with medications such as dopamine. And sometimes when the dopamine effects are wearing off, a lot of patients with Parkinson's disease have trouble with dystonia. Specifically, the most common distressing symptoms I see in my patients is toe curling and cramping in the legs. Specifically, when they wake up first thing in the morning, it's very hard for them to move. And during the day when they take the medication, the medication kicks then they get some degree of benefit from the from the medication. The dystonia gets better, but by the time they're approaching their next dose, the dystonia kicks in again and causes that again, that exquisite contracture of the toes. A lot of the time it is worsened by activity. Uh, a lot of my Parkinson's patients tell me that, you know, especially after a long day of walking or a lot of hard work, or when they are actually exerting themselves, they notice that the toes curl, specifically early on in the disease, when my, the patients are trying to be really active with bike 
walking and running and things like that. They notice that uh, unlike before, when they try to run and try to walk, they start to develop the the amount of distance they could do, amount of exercise they could do that is very limited. And one of the reasons it's limited is because of this, this tonic contraction in the toes and the feet and the, and the calves, which makes it difficult for them to continue. So those are the few things about the epidemiology of dystonia. And now let me talk about how do we see dystonia or how do you manifest dystonia? So dystonia can be noted in many different ways. A lot of the times it is not present. Like, you know, we, we discussed the Oppenheim's description that the dystonia was not present when they were completely rested. But when you do a certain activity, it triggers the dystonic state. Similarly, sometimes you have a tremor associated with dystonia. So there is a, because of the muscle contraction, the limbs involved or the neck sometimes involved shakes. And as a result of that, you develop a tremor, uh, which is a dystonic tremor. Sometimes dystonia is manifest as overflow. What does motor overflow mean? Means that when you, in commonly, when you're resting, there is no problem with dystonia. But for instance, when you are moving your right hand, you start to notice that the left arm, if the person has dystonia, that the other limb, which is not in, which is, which is resting, starts to get into abnormal contractures, abnormal postures. That is called as a overflow dystonia. And sometimes you also, we also notice is more mirror dystonia, which means I see this in certain types of dystonia, specifically task specific dystonia, which we will review in just a minute is like when you do activities in say, for instance, the right fingers, you start to notice that the left fingers normally in a normal healthy state, you should be able to perform movements of the different limbs without having to note similar movements in the other side. But these are called mirror dystonias. And one last clinical feature, which is very important to know, and it is actually pathophysiologic hallmark of dystonia when it was described, it was called this phenomena of alleviating maneuvers or sensory tricks. And it's and in French, uh, it is called as just antagoniste. So that means certain patients with dystonia, for instance, I will give you the most common example is cervical dystonia, whether dystonia involves the neck muscles. So in this, the head is tilted and turned in different directions. But the patients have, have developed this trick whereby they touch the face in certain parts of the face in the forehead or the back of the neck. It's not resisting the abnormal contractor. It's just touching the face in and around the region of the dystonia. And that leads to improvement or alleviation of symptoms. A lot of the times patients report that when they are lying down, they notice that the dystonia improves when they are touching in certain different parts of the body. A lot of the times they use like uh, different tricks of putting certain things in their fingers when the arms are involved. So these are all interesting tricks different patients come up with to help alleviate the dystonia. These are called sensory tricks uh, in dystonia. So these are all the clinical features of, of what we see in dystonia. And now in terms of the classification of dystonia, so dystonia can be classified in many different ways. They can be classified in terms of the age of onset. So they can classify, you know, in infancy, childhood, adolescent onset, early adulthood or late adulthood onset. In terms of the body distribution can be classified as focal. That means only one part of the body is involved, maybe just one limb or the neck or the eyes or the mouth or it can be segmental that two adjacent body parts are involved. It can involve many different body parts or it can involve the whole body. Uh, in terms of the disease progression, they can also be classified in terms of static. That means you develop a dystonia and it stays as, as it is or it progresses over time. There can be also variability. There are certain types of dystonia which manifest only, which are context specific. That means they happen only when you are doing a certain task or when you are have a diurnal variation to it that it can it doesn't happen in the daytime but as the day progresses there are certain there are certain forms of dystonia genetic dystonias which progress or get worse as the day progresses or they have more symptoms in the evening time another thing is a paroxysmal dystonia and there are two kinds of paroxysmal dystonia to speak there is kinesogenic dystonia that means they are triggered when you make a quick sudden movement so these are called paroxysmal dystonias. There are genetic forms of these paroxysmal kinesogenic dystonias. And then there are non-kinesogenic dystonias, which are triggered by certain foods, uh, such as, you know, some people talk about exquisite sensitivity to caffeine, sugars, or sometimes they just happen without any clear uh, reason. So these are called paroxysmal dystonias. Uh, 
associated features. So sometimes dystonias can happen as an independent disorder, but sometimes they have other movement disorders uh, uh, along with dystonia. For instance, in Huntington's disease, there's a lot of movement disorder called chorea, where um, there's involuntary movements of the limbs, like chorea means slow rhythm movements of the limbs. Uh, and along with that, the patients also have dystonia or for instance in parkinson's disease which patients have dystonia so that's the call associate it's an associated feature in all of those things and lastly etiology of dystonia that means what is the cause of these dystonias so there are certain times where we can identify a pathology especially in secondary forms of dystonia like we talked about that there can be evidence of degeneration in the brain there are structural lesions in the brain and as a result of that you have dystonia there are inherited forms of dystonia. There are autosomal dominant genes, which can cause dystonia. There are autosomal recessive genes. There are X-linked disorders, and there are there are recessive disorders that mean um, or mitochondrial disorders. These are all the different parts of the of the cellular mechanisms that can cause dystonias via inherited me mechanisms. Uh, the other things are acquired causes. So we talk some of that things about you know trauma, infections of the brain, drugs, toxins strokes in the brain, any tumors in the brain can, can lead to dystonia if they affect the brain circuitry or brain regions which are involved in dystonia. And lastly, and unfortunately, the most one of the commonest reasons are adult onset sporadic dystonias or, or familial dystonia sometimes for which we don't have a clear reason. There are no lesions in the brain. There's no structural problems in the brain. There are no genes identified with these problems. And it just unfortunately happens in the, in, in as, uh, and we are yet to figure out as to what are the mechanisms of these dystonias. Uh, so moving on, so this is another schema in terms of how the different body parts can be involved. So different types of dystonia, for instance, blepharospasm is involuntary contractions of the muscles around the eyes. So there is spasm of the eyes, patients have a difficulty keeping their eyes open. Then there is oromandibular dystonia, or it's been also described as mage syndrome, where there is dystonia of the eyes, but you also have involvement of the face muscles. So you have trouble with opening your mouth, opening your jaw, sometimes you have tongue involvement. Then there is spasmodic dystonia or laryngeal dystonia. That means a dystonia involving your sound box or your larynx, where you, uh, when you speak normally, it's fine, but especially with high pitch voices, the voice starts to strangulate and that's kind of leads to problems with speaking. Then there is a dystonia called cervical dystonia, or also called a spasmodic torticollis, which involves the neck muscles. And as a result of dystonic contracture, the neck is turned and in, twisted in different directions. So it can be tilted, turned and different directions of the, of the neck. And also sometimes you have a tremor of the head uh, along with the dystonia. Then there are limb dystonia. That means dystonia involving the upper limbs. The most common dystonias involving the upper limbs are sometimes post-traumatic when there is an injury to the muscles. And then as a result, the hand goes into a fixed contracture. A lot of the times we see this after surgeries and, and you know, fractures of the limbs. But the other kind of more common dystonias are called writer's cramp. That means the patients don't have dystonias in a resting state, but when they try to write or perform the act of writing, they develop a dystonia. And similarly, there is a category of, of similar task-specific dystonia called musician's dystonia, which develops in certain, while playing a certain form of musical instrument where the, they are exquisitely amazing with their fine motor activities, with all the other activities, but when they when they go on to play a particular musical instrument, the hand contracts or they develop a dystonic state. I will share some videos of some of my patients from the past who have musician's dystonia in a bit. And lastly, I'm talking about lower limb dystonia. This is actually the most common form of dystonia, which we see in patients with Parkinson's disease. The most common complaints which I hear or my patients tell me about is curling of the toes, foot turning in and cramping of the muscles of the calves and, and the foot. So that's the most common problem uh, that a lot of patients with Parkinson's disease develop is this lower limb dystonia. So there was another question put, uh, could you explain how a person with Parkinson's might develop a persistent lower limb dystonia foot inversion as a result of hip replacement surgery? That's a very good question. And it's unfortunately a complicated mechanism uh, why, uh, why they develop this uh, Dystonia, uh, you can imagine that uh, any kind of stressor, any kind of stress which involves the nervous system. Uh, so when you have a hip replacement surgery, it's not just uh, 
involved, you just don't, not able to access the hip without going through all the nerves and cutting through the different structures which pass through the leg. So it is unfortunate that a lot of patients who develop, who do undergo surgeries, they develop this dystonia. The mechanisms are very complex and I'm not sure that we have a very good answer because it develops in some people more commonly than the others. Uh, and it is a very complicated mechanism involves a lot of aspects about, you know, pain related mechanisms. There is involvement of the, about the amount of activity you are able to do after your surgery. How long is the degree you are bedridden? Even, even a week or two of not being able to use your limb can significantly affect your mobility. And unfortunately, Parkinson's patients are at a loss because they already are, have some degree of disability in terms of, uh, of their ability to walk and things like that. And any surgical procedure, unlike a healthy state, it puts them back a little bit. But yeah, that's a very interesting question. One of the topics which I was, <laughs> I'm hoping to study uh, the mechanisms of pain and developing dystonia post-surgical and post-traumatic uh, related problems. Uh, and uh, <laughs> would need some research on this idea, but NIH is unfortunately doesn't prioritize it research a lot so it's been a struggle to get funding with that but hopefully uh we'll we'll be able to convince them to to provide more dollars towards uh researching this very distressing problem does dbs help dystonia patients yes and that is one of the treatments uh and we will talk about dbs towards the end of the lecture when i talk about treatments of dystonia so moving on uh, i am going to talk show you a few videos about what this is this is a young uh, patient of mine who I saw when I was in fellowship at the NIH. Oops, let me go back and play this video. Maybe the video is choppy, but you will see that this kid, this uh, young man has a lot of contractures of different muscles and the contractures are so much that he is constantly moving his different limbs. Uh, so you will see a lot of different aspects. So what you're seeing here is by putting his hands behind his neck or his head, he's able to make the dystonia a little bit better. So that's kind of the sensory trick maneuver which we described. And you can see every time he's trying to make a movement, the dystonia is triggered and it, it makes it even worse. And as far as the distribution is concerned, you can see uh, now we are trying to make him walk and get out of the bed and the movements kind of worsen the dystonia and make it even more. Uh, so this is a generalized dystonia, as you can see, it is involving this entire body, his upper limbs, lower limbs, uh, as well as the neck and the back. So now he's trying to shake hands and is trying to attempt it, but he doesn't have the, he, the dystonia is making it very difficult for him and is triggering all these extra additional movements everywhere. Uh, so let me let me keep continuing the video here. You can also see his legs are contracted. His legs are scissored or you see they are like contracted at the hips. Also the foot is inverted and the, and the toes are also curled. We don't see it through the foot to the shoes, but that's the problem. So, and as you see again, the sensory trick. So, this is his trick by putting his hands in the back of the head, he's able to minimize the abnormal movement. And if he's not moving and he's staying still, the amount of those dystonic spasms and movements are not as bad. But we're looking at some of the eye movement problems and things like that. So this uh, this young man was part of a research study at the NIH where he had a genetic form of dystonia, where he had some abnormalities in the uh, in metabolism of his lipids in the in the body, and he was being treated with a with an experimental drug targeted towards helping him uh, do that, and he developed this dystonic uh, syndrome, a worsening of his dystonia. Uh, uh, we are not sure as long, uh, because he was almost towards the end of the treatment uh, with the experimental drug and he developed this dystonia and he was also noted to have some other stressors that he was going through at that point. And uh, you will see him walk now and as you can see the toes, the foot is inverted. He has a lot of problems with his trunk that he is, he is what is called is an ophistotonic posturing that his his, his back is arched and his neck mm -hmm. is arched backwards. 
and he has a scissoring quality of gait. So this is a very severe case of generalized dystonia uh, that we see here. Now moving on, this is a case. These are these are some some pictures or cartoons of cervical dystonia. So as you can see, majority of the patients with cervical dystonia have what is called is torticollis. That means head rotation. That means the head is torn either either side. Then uh, patients also have what is called is lateral collis, or the head is tilted to one or the other side. Then what is called is anterior collis, or the head is flexed forward. And then there is phenomena called retrocollis, where the head is backwards. And a lot of the times it's a combination of all these different movements. I have a couple more questions. So we talked about uh, DBS, so we will, we will talk about this more towards the end. And are these tremors, young man in video, painful? Yes, unfortunately, yes, they are. They are painful at times, and he developed cramps and spasms as a result of these. And uh, to, so that that is unfortunately also a big problem in dystonia is the pain related aspects of dystonia which need treatment. Uh, moving on, I'm going to talk about a topic which is uh, which is one of my topics of my research interest as well is a problem called task specific dystonias. Oh, so these are defined as a collection of movement disorders that's present with persistent muscular incoordination or loss of motor control during skilled movement. Or in other words, to simply put it as a loss of motor control confined to a specific motor skill. So we talked about writer's cramp that they are fine normally, but with the task of writing, the hand goes into these abnormal contractures and problems. Similarly, we talked about musicians dystonia where you don't have any problems otherwise, but when you try to play a musical instrument or, or try to perform the fine motor skill that these dystonias uh, are, are noted. So they are context specific dystonias. Uh, I'm going to show a couple of few videos of mine. This is a patient who was a pianist, a very accomplished pianist who played at the symphony. Uh, and so the difficulty is upwards, down. It's pretty, pretty well. So, and, so and just do the ascending scale. Ascending scale. So as you can see, he's describing that when he's going, playing the He's yeah, playing the piano pretty well, I do a lot of but when he is going on the ascending scale, you see yeah. the fingers of the right hand getting contracted and he has trouble. If I, but when straight, he, if I stay straight on and just do what, you know, just with my fingers, that's, I can barely make it up. Yeah. But if I sort of slide, I usually do. So as you can see, the patient is describing it very well, and I'm going to play it just for the sake of it again, that when he's, this is context specific, he can play the piano better than anyone I've seen, even with the dystonia, but he has trouble only playing the ascending scale, but when he goes the descending scale, so there is task specificity within the task specific dystonia. So it's context specific, so they have dystonia playing a specific scale but otherwise they are doing pretty well with the other tasks. Similarly, this was a patient who played the bass guitar scales. and I will have you hear the volume. I hope you guys can hear the volume. So, pretty what do you think? I am not a musician, so as you can say. <laughs> so, yeah, so when you do a sensing pattern, you start with this one and go down. Is that yeah. what it is? Yes. And yes. when you're descending, you start the other way around. Exactly. So right. basically that makes sense because when you're doing ascending, you have more trouble because this is the guy who's triggering. Yeah, the middle finger. Okay, I see. So okay. now I'm going to have you pull up his uh, index finger yeah, so we so can see what's that part. Okay. Yeah. Now I'm going to hold this one okay. and you're going to play with the other ones. I'm actually not even trying to push you. I'm just going to touch it. Touch, it, touch yeah. it. Not really actually. Really. Sometimes you use rubber bands as another mm -hmm. mechanism doing this. So. So this was a patient with, again, another form of task-specific dystonia, but he uh, he had a trouble with playing bass guitar. So what I'm showing here is that when he's trying to play the ascending scale, when he starts the, with the index finger, he had trouble playing that. But when he's when I tried to touch his index finger there, I just was just touching it, as you can hear me speaking. I was not trying to really hold it. Just that sensory input to him made his playing of the of the of the of the guitar much easier. And previously, when his middle finger was 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 tricked was was kind of he was trying holding it up. No offense, but uh, he that was much improved when we tried to give that sensory trick. And and those are the different complications 
the very intricate ways in which patients try to adapt to these dystonias and 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 specifically with this task specific dystonias i'll just play this video again to demonstrate that you know when he was trying to play the scale without me touching his fingers there was this dystonic contraction of the middle finger which kind of further affected his other playing uh, and when we just provided the little sensory input there was an improvement in his playing so it's another form of task specific dystonia Major with uh, piano with, i'm sorry with uh, with guitar yeah. oh, okay so where is it up? I am not a musician, so as you can say. Okay. So, <laughs> no, go ahead. so when you do ascending pattern, you start with this one and go down. Is that yeah. what it is? Yes. And when you're descending, you start the other way around. Exactly. So right. basically, that makes sense because when you're doing ascending, you have more trouble because this is the guy who's triggering. Yeah, the, the middle finger. Okay. So now I'm going to have you pull up his uh, index finger yeah, so we so can see that it. part. Okay. Yeah. Now I'm going to hold this one, okay. and you're going to play with the other ones. I'm actually not even trying to push you. I'm just going to touch it, touch it, touch yeah. it. Not really actually. Really. Sometimes you use rubber bands as another yeah. mechanism doing this. So, and that. Okay. All right. So moving on. Major scales. Uh, okay. We're going to talk about Parkinson's disease, which is probably, uh, Okay, so there was this question. We keep it open. We'll talk about it. DBS helping dystonia symptoms. Yes, it does. Uh, and we will talk a little bit about it, but it's not as great as I would hope it to be. And the symptoms, the, the treatments for Parkinson's for dystonia desire, uh, there's a lot to be desired for, for, for the current state. So let's talk about dystonia and Parkinson's disease. As we talked about it in my previous slide, that more than 30% of people living with Parkinson's disease may experience dystonia as a symptom or as a camp complication of treatment uh, with the levodopa, either at the peak doses when you have a lot of dyskinesias and also develop dystonias along with that, or when your medication wears off. So there is peak dose dystonias and dyskinesias, and then there are wearing off episodes of dystonias and dyskinesias associated with Parkinson's disease, or sometimes that is the presenting symptom. The frequency of dystonia in Parkinsonism is 11% in typical Parkinson's disease. That means one of the presenting symptoms of, 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 of Parkinson's disease can be dystonia in upwards of 10% of people with Parkinson's disease. Uh, atypical Parkinsonisms, uh, which are multi-system atrophy, 21% of people have this dystonia as a presenting symptom. Over 40% of patients with progressive supranuclear palsy have this is another atypical form of Parkinsonism has have developed and about 70% of patients with corticobasal ganglionic degeneration develop dystonia as a presenting symptom or have dystonia as a core symptom of the phenotype. Uh, I think we, the audience is very well aware of what Parkinson's disease is. Let me talk about a little bit about the atypical Parkinsonism. So MSA uh, Parkinsonism is essentially an uh, atypical form of Parkinson's disease where there is involvement of more than just the dopamine producing neurons in the brain. Uh, in PSP, again, there's a lot of atrophy and, and progression of the disease, which is much faster than we see in typical Parkinson's. A lot of PSP patients present, or it stands for progressive supranuclear palsy, which means it's involvement of eye. So people with PSP have trouble with their gaze. That means they have trouble specifically with vertical gaze. They cannot look up or down. Uh, and along with that, there's a lot of rigidity and dystonia involving the trunk and have a lot of problems with walking and balance, specifically a tendency to fall backwards, which develops very early and very and progresses, unfortunately, quickly in them. Another typical feature of PSP is a lot of involvement of swallowing and speech. I understand Parkinson's patients also develop that problem, but it's a gradual process. It's not as severe uh, compared to PSP patients. And lastly, corticobasal ganglionic degeneration. This is one of the severe forms of, uh, of, of it's, a, it's an advanced form of dementia related illness and developed has, has a lot of Parkinsonian features. There's a lot of asymmetry in terms of cortico, in terms of presentation. So corticobasal degeneration patients have sort of almost seem like they have half of the body is dystonic. It almost seems like they might have had a spat stroke of sorts. So the one half of the body is contracted. They lose a lot of memory and thinking related problems. There's a lot of jerky movements they develop or what is called as myoclonus along with that. And there's a lot of stiffness and tightness. And even when we look at the brain, there is also 
an asymmetry in terms of the brain atrophy. So the side of the brain opposite to the side of the more severely affected body is more of is 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 more atrophied or more loss of tissue there. And, and about 70%, close to 70% of those patients develop dystonia. So in and in in a in a snap, in a good, in a simplistic way, if I were to classify typical and atypical Parkinson's disease. Uh, is one in typical Parkinson's disease, you have involvement of the dopamine producing neurons in the brain or the regions of the brain which produce dopamine. So when we give patients with typical Parkinson's disease dopamine by giving them levodopa or other treatments, there is an improvement because the brain regions where the dopamine works are still good. In atypical forms of Parkinson's, the problem is that the structures which produce dopamine are affected, but also the structures where the dopamine works are affected and there is a rapid deterioration of those regions of the brain. And as a result, when we try to treat them with brains, with, with, with uh, dopamine, uh, it doesn't work as well or the effects are not as well because the dopamine has no way to latch onto in the brain because the structures where dopamine was supposed to work are also affected. And as a result, the prognosis in terms of treatment benefit, as well as the degree of or the rapidity at which these patients are disabled is, is severe in patients in, in atypical forms of Parkinson's. Uh, moving on to some of the characteristics. So in Parkinson's disease, what we notice specifically in young onset Parkinson's disease patients, which is development of Parkinson's disease before the age of 40, the typical presentation of dystonia in Parkinson's disease patients is with foot dystonia. That means they complain of specifically with activities when they are going for a run or they have walked for a longer distance. They start to notice cramping of the toes, foot turning in and trouble with that. Other problems, what we what I described is triadal hand and foot deformities. That means the triadal hand deformity is, is what I, if you can see my video here, is you can see uh, that the... Uh, the hand is in this position. That means there is a flexion at the, at the joint between the hand and the fingers, and there is extension between the fingers. So this is a striatal hand deformity. And a striatal toe deformity is like the big toe, always wants to go up. And as one of my patients described it, and they call it as a hitchhiker toe, that all the other toes are down, but the big toe wants to go up. So that's what they describe. The other problem is camptochormia. That means there is involvement of the trunk and the patients have a tendency of hunching forwards and, and, as a tendon, and they keep stooping forward. That's a typical dystonia presentation in Parkinson's disease. In, in PSP, uh, there's a lot of involvement of the axial or, or the trunk, it involves the neck and the back. Also, Parkinson's PSP patients present with what is called blepharospasm, that they have trouble with opening their eyes. So when they have increased blinking and they develop blepharospasm and have a lot of trouble with opening their eyes. And, and they also have this phenomenon of what is called is apraxia of eyelid opening or is called is ALO, where they, once they shut their eyes, there is a, there is, it takes a lot of time for them to be able to open their eyes. A lot of the times these patients can be helped with botulinum toxin injections to improve the spasms of the eyes. In MSA or multi-system atrophy, the most common presentation is this head drop or they develop this enterocolis or neck dystonia. A lot of the times they have laryngeal dystonia or dystonia of speech or when they try to speak, the voice feels strangulated, they can't speak a lot and they develop the skull as a PISA syndrome. So this is after the leaning tower of PISA that the trunk is, 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 is tilted in any direction. So it seems like they're always leaning to one side or the other and develop curvatures of the spine, which affects their ability to, to walk and, and, and maintain a stable or a straight posture. And CBD, as I described, or corticobasal ganglionic degeneration involves an asymmetric dystonia that one part of once it lateralized to one side with severe dystonia, Parkinsonism, and an interesting phenomena which develops in corticobasal degeneration syndrome is an alien limb, which is one of the most fascinating things in neurology, where a person loses ownership of the limb, that the limb tries to do things it's going up, elevated in different directions, and the patients happen to have no control over it, and they have to consciously bring their limb back and make it uh, make it uh, not do things which it would do otherwise. So the patients with this, this is a very distressing, as you can imagine, problem in, in patients with this skin syndrome where they develop this alien limb phenomena where the limb does, has its own mind and it does things without the patient's control. Uh, 
And I'm just going to give a few things about dystonia and young onset PD. Uh, I understand a lot of patients, unfortunately, these days I see who have developing Parkinson's disease in, in, in very young age. Uh, uh, believe it or not, the, the, the age cutoff used to be 50 years for young onset. But now the fact that we see so many patients, the cutoff is 40 years uh, for young onset Parkinson's disease. Uh, there's a most common gene uh, is the PARC2 or the Parkin gene. Patients who have this gene develop the develop this dystonic presentation, and 20% of sporadic cases of young onset Parkinsonism also have this specific gene. We have a genetic study which we are doing, especially uh, uh, at our center. It's called a PD gene study. If you guys are interested in getting your genes tested, uh, which can have implications for you as well as for your for your children. Uh, uh, and Anya and Hana are running those studies. So if you are interested, please feel free to reach out to them. Uh, it's called a PD gene study where we are testing or providing genetic testing for the most common forms of genetic genes which are involved in treatment of Parkinson's disease. Uh, the other advantage for you would be there are certain clinical trials which are coming out next year in the pipeline uh, where there are development of therapies which are targeted towards certain genes uh, and they are, being, they are being developed as a modality of disease uh, disease protection or slowing down the progression of disease in Parkinson's disease. As you can imagine right now, all the treatments which we have for Parkinson's disease are symptomatic that we try to help your symptoms, uh, but there are no therapies uh, which are available or treatments that can slow down the progression of disease and, uh, and so something to look out for in the future. Dystonic features have been described in about 40% of cases, as well as early complications of levodopa therapy. And lastly, I would say there are other genes which are associated with dystonia and dystonic features as a presenting feature are this gene called PARC7 or DJ1 and PINK1 or PARC6 genes. So this is there's an expanding spectrum and we are learning more and more about these uh, genes in Parkinson's. I'll, I'll see what are the questions we have. Uh, all right, so Anya just provided the information for the PD gene testing study. So if you guys are interested, uh, email her about it and, and they will be able to accommodate you. A lot of the times we can try to do this when you have a visit with your doctors at our center uh, and we can try to get you, they can try to arrange so that you can come in and it's, it's essentially a swab of the saliva that you have to do uh, and it's pretty quick. They just have to go through the consent and things and they do an excellent job at uh, at doing this very efficiently. Thanks, Anya. Okay, so moving on. Uh, lastly, this is the complicated part uh, of, of how, why does it happen? I think the question before was also brought up by one of the patients is, you know, why does dystonia develop after, after going through a hip surgery? So in general, in a larger scheme of things, I think uh, with my interest in motor control physiology, this is how I look at how the motor system works. So for you to make a movement in the limb, you need your top part of the brain or the motor cortex to, to have the command that, okay, move. After that, the command goes through different structures of the brain, which is the basal ganglia, which is the comparator, which gives you the scaling of movement as to how big the movement needs to be or how small the movement needs to be. Eventually, the movement is executed at the peripheral level in the muscle. After the movement is completed, there is a feedback that, you know, did we actually perform the movement at the exact amplitude that you wanted it to? And then there is some fine tuning of the movement between the circuitry of the brain to make the movement to be precise at the rate which you want to, at the speed that you want to. And there is this feedback loop, which is important, uh, which corrects for errors. And as you can imagine, a lot of these structures, which I mentioned here, are involved in Parkinson's disease and a lot of the other dystonias. And unfortunately, uh, there's a problem at many different regions of the brain, uh, which can result. So dystonia is a problem of abnormalities in brain networks. So all this smooth, uh, Try, uh, smooth carrying of information from the from the from when you want to send a motor command that okay this is what you want to do, and there is something which falls apart in in this as a result on account of the pathology in the brain or different structures of the brain involved. Uh, what we know and what we are trying to what we are trying to understand and realize as there is 
abnormalities of different nodes, so this large brain network and different forms of dystonia have different abnormalities or predominant involvement of these different circuitries in the brain or predominant involvement of these different structures in the brain, which can lead to dystonia. So there is emerging evidence that different path of there are that different dystonia subtypes, like I described, dystonia and Parkinson's disease, cervical dystonia, task specific dystonia. There is different pathophysiologic underpinnings and different circuitries in the brain which are involved. So lumping it all together, which has been unfortunately the past literature, the way it has been lumped into this one category of dystonia is not the right way. And we are learning uh, about this, that there are different pathophysiologic bases and the need for developing customized treatments as is one of my interests towards for treating different types of dystonia. So for instance, in task specific dystonia, I showed you those musicians they have a predominant abnormality in the cortical. As you can imagine, this is such a complicated problem playing musical instrument, the precision it requires. And some of my research and the research from the other colleagues uh, have shown that there is a problem of this brain regions, which are in the brain cortex, which are implored and complicated. And, uh, and, uh, and this is one of the reasons I'm, I'm trying to study this specific form of dystonia. And cervical dystonia, as you can see, there is abnormality in, the, in another structures in the basal ganglia and in the cerebellum, which leads to an abnormal head position and postures because for some reason, your brain is made to believe that your head being tilted to the right or twisted in a direction is the normal state. And to break that is, is the, to break that normalcy and to disintegrate that abnormal uh, plasticity, as we call in the brain, is, 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 is one of the ways in which I'm hoping to develop therapies targeting for Parkinson's, well, not for Parkinson's specifically, but for all these different types of dystonias. Uh, and lastly, in terms of treatment, as I would say, we have for Parkinson's disease, a lot of the times the dystonias are responsive to levodopa. A lot of the times we can prescribe anticholinergic medications. These are usually helpful in young onset patients, uh, sometimes with Parkinson's disease, but a lot of the times the genetic dystonias, which we describe the anticholinergic medications like Artane, uh, trihexyphenidyl, which is, which, is the, which is the generic name for it, it helps. In elderly patients with Parkinson's disease, I absolutely don't use these medications because it has a lot more side effects than the benefits you can get from these medications. It affects your cognition. And unfortunately, I've seen that it worsens the dystonia in some of my Parkinson's disease patients. Sometimes medications, muscle relaxant, such as you know, baclofen and, and other, other medications of the, uh, of the antispasm class can be helpful in Parkinson's disease patients to relieve some of the spasms in the muscles and also other forms of dystonias. Uh, another form of treatment which we can have for Parkinson's disease patients with certain form of dystonias, for instance, with the toe curling and the foot dystonias, what we can do is we can do botulinum toxin injections targeting the muscles which are involved. For instance, if you have toe curling, we can target and inject botulinum toxins into those specific muscles which cause those tonic contractions of the, of the foot muscles. Uh, similarly, if you can imagine for the neck muscles, if the head is tilted and turned in different directions, we can inject specific group of muscles. And the toxins uh, seem to alleviate some of those peripheral features. Does it really help the dystonia itself? I'm not really sure or certain about it because it mainly has alleviates this peripheral tightness and spasm in the muscles, but it doesn't really help the true pathophysiology or what is really driving these structures is these abnormalities which are established in the brain. And, and I think the future of treatment for, par for Parkinson's dystonias and other forms of dystonia should be targeting that brain abnormalities instead of treating peripherally with these toxin injections. And lastly, I think some of the, some of the, some of the patients, uh, those questions raised about deep brain stimulation. So deep brain stimulation helps uh, the deep brain stimulation for Parkinson's disease specifically helps as much as your levodopa helps. So if you have a very good response to levodopa, you do get a response with deep brain stimulation. Uh, I would say sometimes for specifically with the foot and toe curling, uh, there is, there is 
there is a little bit of more benefit with deep brain stimulation, especially when we target the globus pallidum. And previously, there used to be pallidotomies or lesioning of the brain, certain brain structures, which used to be done to alleviate some of the symptoms of dystonia. As far as the idiopathic dystonias are concerned, like the other forms of dystonias with the neck and things like that, uh, I don't think deep brain, deep brain stimulation has some benefit. Is it great? I don't think so. It, it improves, it alleviates some of the symptoms, but it's not, not great, I would say. Uh, and we need to kind of selection of the patients who benefit from these medications and, and uh, needs to be done in an advanced way in terms of who would benefit from, the, from these treatments. In general, that's why we have a very comprehensive approach towards this that we look at very different aspects when we make decisions about what surgical targets are good for patients in terms of treatment of dystonia uh, specifically and the other Parkinson symptoms. Uh, so it, 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 it needs a, a lot more than just a simplistic uh, selection of, of whether or not deep brain stimulation works. Uh, I will talk about different toxins. So there are four different types of toxins which are available. Three of them are type A toxins, onabotulinum toxin A, which is Botox. There is abobotulinum toxin called Dysport. There is incabotulinum toxin, which is another type of toxin which we use to treat dystonia and Parkinson's and other forms of dystonia. Uh, and it has been helpful as long as it in the hands of an expert injector, if they know what they are doing, it is helpful and it has helped a lot of my patients and I, I help, uh, I get referrals from other colleagues in the division as well. Uh, and several, I'm not sure, several of you might be my patients already who, whom I inject with these toxins. And lastly, Rima botulinum toxin uh, uh, here, uh, called myoblock, it's a type B toxin. Uh, a lot of the times I use this toxin to help with siluria, like excessive salivation in patients, but it's also been shown to be effective in terms of helping cervical dystonia and other forms of cranial dystonias and Parkinson's and other Parkinson-like disorders, right? typical Parkinsonisms. And lastly, coming to deep brain stimulation. So this is a, a, a nice picture showing the most common uh, sites in the brain where we do this or implant these deep brain stimulation electrodes. So as you can imagine, this is the, this is the brain structures. Uh, a lot of you have had DBS in the past, and this is what is called the globus pallidum. So this is where we insert the electrode and the other nucleus, which we use for treatment of dystonia and in Parkinson's disease specifically, is the subthalamic nucleus, which involves inserting the electrode and, and doing, and, and then the whole system is externalized, the wire goes under the skin, nothing is sticking out and you have a pacemaker which stimulates the specific regions of the brain and by modulating the brain uh, networks, you get an improvement in your dystonia symptoms. We also, for specifically talking about dystone, deep brain stimulation, we have other top talks which are scheduled, or I understand, on a quarterly basis or two or three times a year. And we also are very thankful to our patients who have been operated with deep brain stimulation in the past who are who make themselves available and when we call them our dbs ambassadors who share their experience with our patients and uh, and and these this program is called the dbs ambassadors program where we talk specifically i i or my colleague dr luo uh, we talk about the medical aspects and the neurological aspects about how we select patients and how what are the criteria for dbs uh, being effective or, or a therapy for you. Uh, and also our surgeon, Dr. Alterman, uh, gives his perspective from the surgical standpoint as to what are the process, what is the process of deep brain stimulation surgery involved. Uh, and and, uh, and we, can, we can, you can visit our website, our PD program to learn more about the series. And, uh, and, and if you are, uh, uh, are part of our uh, email chain, which I advise that you can share with Anya and Hannah so you can get uh, information about all the programs, all the symposiums, and all the wonderful things which we have to offer for our patients. So that's that's what I had to say, and thank you for your attention, and I'm going to start to answer 